So now social anxiety is a debil debilitating fear of judgment by others in social situations where a person may be exposed to humiliation or rejection. It is fundamentally attached to a core belief of deficiency. It can last for at least six months and it would and it can restrict activities, interests, and relationships. Um, according to the NIMH, an estimated 9 to 10% of adolescents have had a social anxiety disorder or live with one. And the prevalence for social anxiety among adolescents is higher for females at 11% than for males at 7%. So let's take a minute here. I know this is a lot of math for a um, Wednesday evening, but if 34% of kids with ADHD have a diagnosed anxiety disorder. And frankly, I see much higher rates of that. And so do my colleagues in practice, but that's what the research is showing us because maybe people have anxiety, but they don't qualify for the disorder diagnosis. Um, what, what, what this tells us is that nine to 10% of all teenagers, so 10% of teenagers. So um, according to Thomas Brown, Dr. Thomas Brown, whose work I really respect, he's such a leader in our field, field he, thinks like, he thinks that about one third of kids with ADHD have an experience social anxiety. That's a lot, that's a big number. Now, the increased incidence of social anxiety during adolescence is probably not that surprising. Um, adolescence is a time when, when kids are moving from a unique reliance on their family unit and learning how to interact with peers in a way that will set them up for the rest of their lives. They become increasingly autonomous from their parents and rely more on their peer group. Now we know that process is a little bit slower um, for people, for kids with ADHD, but it's still what's going on. Now let's look at some def a definition of social anxiety disorder. Um, a Gunther age 17 says, I feel that a lot of times I genuinely do want to socialize and get to know people, but trauma and fear of rejection disables me from doing it. It's hard to fight my brain to meet this goal. So traits of social anxiety include a responding to a trigger such as a social conversation or a performance having to carry out a function of some kind in front of another person. That could be ordering a donut at Dunkin' Donuts. I'm from Massachusetts. I have to bring up Dunkin' Donuts. Um, or being observed by someone like you're eating lunch in the cafeteria or at your desk um, that is beyond the actual threat of the situation. So the response to the trigger, I have to talk in person, I have to perform this task, or I'm being observed, is greater than the actual threat that is inherent in the situation. So, you know, you might have um, a child who's freaked out that people are looking at them while they're in line at the cafe um, with you to get a, a muffin and a um, hot chocolate after school. And so they, they go back to the car and they want you to order it for them. There, you might have a teenager who does that too. Um, or you could be an adult who is, is very uncomfortable speaking in public. And so you choose that it's easier not to get the muffin and coffee, even though you'd like it. So what are some core components of social anxiety? So um, there are cognitive components of social anxiety. These are conscious or what we call hot thoughts based on those underlying assumptions and negative core beliefs that we see in what's called rumination, that, that overthinking that a lot of kids with ADHD and anxiety um, you know, practice. Uh, we see behaviors, safety-seeking actions that include avoidance to any situation that could um, offer a trigger or pose a threat. And we see emotional components, self-criticism, self-doubt, shame and distress, and then physiological symptoms, perspiration, blushing, 
jittery limbs, like your hands are shaking, your arms are shaking, your legs are shaking, your knees are, are shaking, maybe your voice is quivering, maybe you stutter, maybe you experience nausea. So uncertainty about how an event or a task will unfold lies at the core of all types of anxiety, but it particularly lies at the core of social anxiety when that event or that task involves other people or either communicating with them or being um, seen by them. Um, Christine Podesky says, anxiety equals the likelihood of a fear coming true divided by coping skills. So I'm gonna repeat that because that's a lot to, to, to process. Anxiety equals a likelihood of a fear coming true divided by coping skills. So I have this big fear about something coming true, but I don't have a lot of coping skills. So my anxiety is going to be very high. But if I have a fear about something coming true, but I have a lot of coping skills, my anxiety is gonna be lower. So social anxiety used to be considered a phobia, like a fear of spiders or elevators or heights. But in, in the recent years and in the latest version of what's called the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, the DSM, it's, um, it's been shifted to its own diagnosis because it's more than a phobia. It, it, because of these underlying core beliefs uh, of negativity, of self-doubt, um, that get activated um, in people who struggle with it. What do you think is the primary core belief for your child or teen related to social anxiety? I will embarrass myself. I will make a bad first impression. People won't like me right away or at all. I'm not very attractive. I wish I were. Um, I'm not very smart. A lot of kids with ADHD think they're not smart, which is definitely not true. They just learn differently, but they've, they've um, absorbed that they're not smart because they learn differently. Or a fear of their, um, of their weaker verbal impulse control that they might say or do something that's offensive and not know that it was an, uh, that it wasn't okay to do that. And I see this a lot with kids with ADHD. And this is part of what leads to having anxiety. That a lot of times kids with ADHD have gotten a, so much what they perceive as negative feedback, constructive criticism about what they could do differently or how they could do things that they're, they walk around you know, they've sort of, they kind of walk around on eggshells in a way. Like, when is the next time I'm going to mess up that I didn't know I did something wrong in the first place? And that actually, um, over time, develops into, you know, persistent anxiety. Now, um, you know, rejection sensitivity dysphoria is something that I've talked about and written about for those of you who follow my work. Um, and we know that it's a common coexisting condition with ADHD, but it's not a formal diagnostic category. Rejection sensitivity dysphoria refers to intense feelings related to the belief that you've let other people down, the belief that you've embarrassed yourself, or the belief that you failed at something or you've made a serious unfixable mistake and as a result, or maybe you did fail at something, um, but as a result, people pull back their support, love, or respect. People who live with RSD live with extreme emotional pain um, and it can plague children, teens, and adults because they live with pain that, um, they believe that a rejection is inevitable and they may perceive a rejection even when it hasn't taken place. People with, R with RSD struggle with letting go of past hurts or rejections and experience heightened emotional sensitivity. Um, they may hold on to unkind words or actions directed towards them or uh, for months or years. They just can't, you know, seem to shake off a comment and believe at some level that they deserved whatever negative, harsh, critical, unkind comment they received. Um, perhaps 
um, you or your child may think if you have this, that you've fallen short. And with your exquisite sensitivity, no matter what anyone else says, you can't bounce back. It's especially tough to recover from personal criticism or actual rejection. And so you're living in a one down position that intensifies RSD and exacerbates shame. I think it's important to realize that there's nothing wrong with you. If you have this, you are just wired to feel things more intensely. And you have a, um, a tendency to replay unpleasant in, interpersonal interactions over and over. Rejection sensitivity dysphoria is directly linked to social insecurity, which is why it's under the umbrella of social anxiety. So let's discuss uh, the five C solution to managing anxiety. Because if we talk about the five C's, which is in the, what I've written about, it's my approach and I've written about it in my book and in various articles and my card deck, um, this approach will help you and help them. So the first thing that we wanna do is, is, is really address self-control. When kids are anxious, they are often not breathing. This breathing, slows down the amygdala hijack. Some kids like to draw or listen to music. When we can stay calm ourselves and avoid simple reassurance like, oh, it's not that big a deal or dismissing concerns, you'll be fine. Uh, so we're sort of letting them know we're minimizing their concerns and kind of saying they're not rational. Um, when we avoid reassurance and dismissal, we actually validate our kids experience and we let them know that we're here for them in a different way. So we need to settle the, bo the body and then we can help settle the mind. So what's the second C? Compassion. So we're gonna consider the situation or the fear from our child's perspective, even if it doesn't make any sense to us. Our job is to maintain support in the face of irritating or frustrating behaviors that are demonstrating how out of control your child feels. Anxiety makes people act in ways that are nonsensical. So we want to remember that their anxiety is an ineffective attempt to create safety based on their limited skills and limited coping resources. So we want to ask some questions when their body's settled that promote understanding. Questions that begin with what, how, when, where. We do not want to ask questions that start with why, because the answer will be, I don't know. Um, then there's collaboration. So we want to work together uh, and discuss logical ways to deal with scary thoughts or circumstances instead of avoiding them. Um, use humor, encourage making lists of worries before bed so they don't have to think about them when they're trying to fall asleep, and then they can pick up their worries the next day. I tend to refer to that as creating a worry motel. Some with younger kids, I might actually take a shoe box and we might decorate it, and they can write down things they're worried about, put it in the box, and then the next day they can decide, okay, yep, I want this one. It, it adds a levity to it that anxiety doesn't like, which is good because we want to do things that anxiety doesn't like to try to minimize it. Our goal is not to dismiss anxiety altogether. Our goal is to help our kids have a hand on the volume and intensity button so that they can lower it and feel a sense of autonomy in relationship to their anxiety rather than feeling controlled um, and run over by it. Um, sometimes kids like to draw pictures of their anxiety. What does the worry monster look like? Sometimes I encourage people to give a name to their, to their worry monster. Mine is called Perfect Poindexter. If you have a worry monster as an adult, consider naming it. It's very helpful to have a name, to know what Perfect Poindexter is saying to me so that I can use my, 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 my healthy, wiser self to talk back to it. 
Um, warriors have really creative imaginations and um, we want to brainstorm things with them to say when worry re rears its ugly head. If we don't look at the pattern of the worry, um, we're going to play whack-a-mole because you're going to deal with this worry and then up uh, this worry is going to come up. So we want to look at when is this worry occurring? What are the characteristics or traits of the environment or the situation that's leading to this worry? Consistency. Routines as much as possible actually foster a sense of predictability over certain aspects of life in the face of so many other uncertain and unmanageable things every day. They provide comfort to kids, but we don't want them to develop rigidity. So we want to basically aim for steadiness, steadiness in our responses, steadiness in the routine. So maybe there's days when there's an exception, you label it an exception. Maybe there's some spontaneity, you enjoy that. Um, but the, the, there are certain things in their lives that are predictable. And then lastly, celebration. So we wanna notice when your child or teen makes efforts, not just successes. So we're gonna break down um, tasks related to anxiety into what I call experiments. And we'll talk about that in a minute. So we want to notice the efforts that they're making, what I call efforting, not just the successes, because these are kids who need encouragement to keep going. So we're going to talk about um, risk-taking and courage and when they're doing these things. And if you're using some incentives to help them um, can combat their anxiety, then we're going to follow through on those. Now, how are we actually going to deal with worry in real time? And the way we're going to deal with worry in real time is to change the relationship to worry. So we're going to change our relationship to worry by externalizing it, by using levity. We're going to name that worry. Um, we're going to treat it like a puzzle and investigate it like it's Sherlock Holmes. Instead of being surprised when worry emerges in X, Y, or Z predictable situations, we're going to expect to worry. We're going to look at the fact that worry says blah, 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 and you can't handle it. What are we going to say back to that? What are we going to help our kids say back to it? Because here's the fact. Anxiety is an overestimation of the problem and an underestimation of the resources to deal with it. We have to shift focus from that overestimation to acknowledging the resources and building up those resources. We're going to work together on creating solutions to reduce the power and influence of, of kids' worries. Brainstorm things they can say when worry rears its ugly head. One or two key phrases is really helpful. Um, actually worry, uh, I can handle it um, if it's a small piece. So I'm going to do something small and then I'm going to see how that goes. Or actually worry, I can handle it because we won our soccer game on Saturday. So I know that I can do a lot of, you know, good, cool things. I'm strong and I am brave because I, I played really aggressively and I helped score a goal or something like that. Okay. Um, talk about logical ways to deal with scary thoughts or circumstances instead of avoiding, avoiding them. If you haven't seen this on YouTube, it's so great and absolutely hilarious is um, there's the, the you can just Google monster spray, you know, on YouTube. And there are a number of videos of parents who like take a, a can of deodorant or air freshener and they cover it with paper and they that says monster spray and they give it to their kids who are afraid of like closets and monsters under their bread and the kids are spraying the, the spray under the bed and in the closet to shrink the monster you know but they feel empowered they're like yes i sprayed the spray i have conquered the monster and it helps them feel that they have some sense of empowerment in a situation where they generally are not feeling empowered because that's what uh, that's part of the anxiety a lot of times with anxiety, what we talk about, what we hear from kids is what they don't want. I don't want this to happen. We want to flip that and say, what do, and ask what you do want. I want 
to be able to sing my solo uh, in the chorus concert. Um, okay, so what are you willing to do to do that? I'm willing to practice it in front of the family. I'm willing to um, to uh, practice it a lot myself. I'm willing to um, to practice it in front of the chorus before I have to perform it or whatever it is. I'm willing to go go to the stage and practicing it after school, even if no one's in the auditorium, et cetera, et cetera. We want to help kids um, recall a time when they were afraid of something and met the challenge successfully. What steps did they use to do this? Um, and write those down because anxiety is very skilled at erasing memories of courage and triumph. Now, this learning process happens over time um, by reminding kids of the way that they have succeeded in the past in spite of worry. Um, I also want you to, rem to, to work on this with your kids, is that there are body, bodily signals that serve as warning signs that worry is present. I don't know what those are for you. For me, I might feel a tightness in my chest or maybe a little bit of tightness in my belly. Sometimes maybe uh, my face will get hot. Talk about as a family, like how do you notice that you're wor you're feeling you're worrying or you're feeling anxious? Like what is your body sent? What signal is your body sending you? Because if you, we can identify that signal, then we can do the breathing technique, alternate nostril breathing. Um, uh, you know, breathe into your your hand on your chest or on your hand on your belly, or what I call triangle breathing. Breathe in for four, hold for four, breathe out for six pause and do this several times. We want to settle the nervous system and breathing is one of the best ways to do that. Now, some kids like to settle their nervous system by watching TV, by shooting some, some hoops in, um, in the, uh, the basketball um, uh, court down the street um, or jumping on the trampoline in your backyard. Whatever it is, maybe it's playing some music on the guitar. We want to have a list of things that help slow ang the anxiety reaction down and settle the body. And then we can talk about ways to um, intervene. Reassurance gives kids short-term relief. Um, it's a decrease in the anxiety they're feeling in the moment, but it actually gives them a longer term increase because kids learn to use other people, particularly you, as a crutch versus intentionally talking to themselves in ways that help them move forward bravely. So reassuring, rescuing, overprotection, extra safety chatter, um, all of these things actually um, are, are, can be, um, you know, might feel good in the moment, but they're not going to teach kids the thing they need to know, which is how to talk to themselves and reassure themselves when they're feeling anxious. So our job as adults is to stay neutral and compassionate without trying to fix things. Um, uh, this means we're, we're going to um, work on uh, using the worst case scenario. Well, let's see what happens. If, if you follow this worry to what happens then, and then what? And then what? Can you live with that? Can you tolerate it? Um, a lot of times if we do the and then what uh, exercise, kids get to this place and they start laughing because either they're dead or um, what they're imagining is, is, is just so far-fetched that they, that they laugh at themselves for it. So that, um, that exercise and then what? Hmm. Can you live with that? Nope, I can't. Uh, then let's brainstorm what to do. Uh, and then what? Is very helpful. We want to distinguish between the noise of worrying and the signal of anxiety. So the signal of anxiety is that bodily um, signal, and the noise of worrying is the chatter in our head that we can't do whatever it is we think we should we want to do. So instead, what we want to say is, I'm willing to feel unsure. I'm willing to grab onto my courage and be brave and try it. Most anxieties take over the thinking brain. So once the body settled, using language and logic to calm it down, to th brainstorm what would the next right action be can be very helpful. People have to want kids and adults to change 
and reach a goal more than they want to listen to the noise of worrying in order to combat anxiety. So we want to reframe the I can'ts into I'm not sure if, or I can't into I'm curious about. So what are some tools you can use for responding to your kid's anxiety? First of all, validate instead of reassure. You're right to be scared. You're not sure you can sing your solo in front of the audience. It's natural to worry in that situation versus, oh, you'll be fine. Don't worry about it. We want to validate. Um, you know, one of the challenges with reassurance is that it doesn't help kids understand, you know, that they could be disappointed. They might experience disappointment and what to do when they do. Because part of taking a risk is that it might not work out. And that means that there is the possibility of being disappointed. And we're all born with a very flabby disappointment muscle. Over time, you know, it gets a workout, right? And some people um, have too much of a workout, unfortunately, and some people have just the right amount, like, the, like uh, Goldilocks and the Three Bears. So um, we want to use probability. Um, when I've done workshops with kids, um, they really like probability. Um, that's a good question to ask when we do the and then what's. You know, what is the probability that you think this could happen? Um, we, I talked about the worst case scenario, but here's the thing. We want to talk about the best case scenario too. We want to honestly kind of predict pleasure. What's the good thing that could happen? What's a positive outcome? How would we kind of work toward that rather than focusing on what could go wrong? Sometimes um, with anxiety, you just have to fake it till you make it. Like there, you're may, you may feel really nervous when you go up to the microphone to sing that song and you're gonna have to smile and look at your music teacher and start. There's, there's sometimes there's just no two ways about it. Um, um, and often um, the final thing is to take a risk. You know, taking a risk is something that we want to do, but we want to break these, these tasks down into small doable risks, not huge Mount Everest, you know, expedition kind of risks. Because um, what happens is that when kids with ADHD worry and they experience flooding, their system is sort of shuts down with overwhelm freeze, like a deer in a headlight. Um, and this makes their worries seem so much more insurmountable. So let's look at some cognitive interventions specifically geared towards social anxiety. So cognitive behavioral therapy with or without medication is, has, can, is considered um, the uh, gold standard treatment for social anxiety. And um, like medications for ADHD, medications can assist with this, um, perhaps sometimes uh, what we call SSRIs, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. Um, but pills aren't going to teach skills. And so the, your, your, your child or teen may feel somewhat less anxious on the medication, but they still need the skills, just like your child or teen may be able to focus better and be more attentive um, on their ADHD medication, but they still need to learn the executive functioning skills. So the goal for, for, for treating social anxiety is to establish healthier alternatives to safety-seeking behaviors, namely avoidance, um, to be able to be present in a situation instead of lost in thoughts that a person creates about what other people are thinking. Because this is what social anxiety is about. I'm thinking that I know what you're thinking about me. And you don't unless someone says something to you, um, you know, or you hear people talking and laughing and then you hear your name, that is going to trigger rejection sensitivity and, and, and nervousness about, so, about social situations. So what we want to do is first of all, help kids be present because what happens with social anxiety is that kids are in their head, but not in a good way. They're in their head, listening to the thoughts those worry thoughts, that worry monster thoughts about what's wrong with them and how other people are noticing it. Oh my God, 
she's looking at my face and she sees that pimple right on my nose. Everybody can see the pimple. It's huge. Or um, uh, I don't know what to say. I know that he knows that I don't know what to say. Everyone's going to laugh at me when I say something. So what we want to do is set behavioral goals that are low risk experiments to build confidence. And these are learning experiences that test or defy those negative beliefs. Um, so, you know, the pattern might be before, uh, before um, an, uh, like um, going to a party, there's a lot of nervousness. During the party, there's a lot of nervousness. And then afterwards, there's a lot of judgment and recriminations about how much you messed it up and nobody really liked having you around. And we want to shift that to before the party, there are some, we want to identify some negative beliefs that are feeding the worry monster. We want to stop feeding the worry monster so it shrinks. Um, and during the party, I'm going to tell myself that um, some phrase that I'm, uh, that is, uh, that I've created with my parent or my caregiver or my coach or my therapist to to be uh, to be able to be with other people and be present and then afterwards i'm going to talk about the pros and the cons of the event what we want to teach our kids is that feeling awkward is okay it's normal everybody feels awkward sometimes so you want to set up small behavioral goals i'm going to smile at so and so today i'm going to talk to this one person um, I'm going to join uh, in the kicker game, or I'm going to sit at a lunch table with a, two of my friends, even if we don't know the other people at the table. Um, so then we want to um, think about how do you engage in a conversation? I'm going to focus on the conversation that's occurring as much as I can, which is hard. And I'm going to say a reflective comment that shows I'm listening. And then after, I'm going to talk about how the situation went, okay? So that I have some tools that you can start to record and help your kids keep track of. Now, mindfulness is, it doesn't mean meditation. But it's a form of practicing, you know, awareness like yoga or Tai Chi or just self-reflection. And meditation alone is not actually a cure for social anxiety, but meditation can really assist with managing anxiety because you have an awareness of your thoughts and you can talk back to them. So we want to be curious about things rather than judgmental because what socially anxious people, kids do, people, because we all, uh, adults too, is to evaluate themselves negatively and assume um, so that they're not present in the moment because they're consumed with these thoughts. Um, they also assume that the other person is judging them poorly when they're speaking instead of just being present with the speaking. And so that's the, the, the type of mindfulness we're looking about. Um, we want to develop the capacity for curiosity with other people and how to engage in conversation by practicing reflective listening. And you can do this with your kids in role plays. You say something, they repeat it back. They say something, you repeat it back. Then the next step, you do that a couple times. Then the next level is you say something, they ask you a question. They say something, you ask them a question. You're teaching them how to have a conversation. In terms of reducing uh, and addressing rejection sensitivity dysphoria, a helpful tip is to consistently nurture your strengths, okay? Focus uh, as much on, as possible on what you like to do, what your child likes to do, um, and what they do well. So we're growing the things that kids like about themselves and they that they're their, their, their talents and um, their interests. And we're trying to get that, you know, to be um, as equal to or bigger than the worry monster. So how are we going to do that? We're going to start paying attention to some positive efforts. We're going to help them manage um, big feelings with start, stop, take a pause in the action for a predetermined period of time, go to a place that can help you calm down and self-soothe, come back together using that reflective listening. What happened? What would you like uh, to have done differently? What would you like to do next? How, what are we, what's the next right thing? 
then allow doing that next right thing, which is the process of recovery. And then maybe later the next day, you can try to teach something about how to manage big feelings. Um, we're going to help them practice to take a pause before responding to a question um, by saying, mm, that's a good question or blah, blah, blah comment. Let me think about that or ask for some time after an unpleasant interaction and say, I'll get back to you. I worked with um, a client who had um, ADHD and, and what we now will call Asperger's and um, uh, dyslexia. And um, she came in and she said, you know, Dr. Sharon, you know, I, I talk to kids, kids talk to me and then I don't know what to say. So I don't say anything. And then they think I'm mad at them. And I said, well, that's really interesting. What if you said to them, hmm, that's a really good question or, hmm, that's really interesting. I'd like to think about it and get back to you. And then you'd have some time to reflect and then you return to them. She said, that's interesting. You know, I could try that. And she was 12. And um, next week she came back and she's like, OMG, it works. I can say I'm going to think about it and nobody has hurt feelings or they're mad at me. And then I can think about it and then I can say something. It's great. So we want to have prearranged time apart tools like time apart or relaxation techniques or healthy self-soothing self activities. When people are feeling bad about themselves, going for a run, listening to music, connecting with a friend, um, drawing, um, doing a puzzle, um, you know, gaming might be part of that, of course. Um, what happens is that kids can get into an over-focus loop and then spiral into shame. And they're unable to forgive themselves or to stop replaying an incident or forgive others. And um, we want to help them practice self-compassion. We all make mistakes and learning from them is how we grow. When things don't go the way you hoped, take the time you need to regroup. Talk and treat yourself the way you would talk to your beloved cat or dog, or if you're a teenager, what you would say to a third grader with a skinned knee. Develop a few self-statements of encouragement. I'm stronger than I think. My mind is creative and unique. I can make a mistake and be a good person. I can get hurt and bounce back. So essentially what we want to do is enjoy an apple, teach communication skills, ask to join, ask relevant questions, and assess what's happening by looking at people's faces. You know, my friend Caroline McGuire talks about this assessment about what's happening as being a social spy. Um, you know, P, physical proximity and volume. Place yourself appropriately near to others. Observe their volume and do the same. T teach your kids what is the distance uh, to, by, with which we stand when we talk to other people. And I have my arm out here because in our culture, it's usually about an arm's distance. And so, you know, when people get within your, 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 your body, your body bubble, I call it, um, it, it can make them uncomfortable. And a lot of times kids with ADHD aren't so aware of their bodies and the body bubbles. So we want to really teach that for them, teach that to them. Help them participate with curiosity, with using reflective statements that show that they're listening, that they're actually curious about what someone's saying rather than waiting for their turn to talk. And the dinner table is a great time to teach this skill with dinner table conversation. Lay off the self-criticism. We want to really help our kids not um, engage in that negative self-talk and instead listen to what is positive, okay? So we want to turn down the volume on the internal voice that guesses what other people are saying wrongly and stay present and engaged with what's happening now by listening and enjoy connecting. What are the benefits of being around people? Most children and teens want to have connection. It's part of how we're you know, built as humans. We want to connect with others. And if we are not able to connect with others or we're avoiding or we're rejecting the, the opportunities to connect with others, it's often because we don't feel good about ourselves or your child or teen, um, 
is afraid of being made fun of and experiencing further rejection. Maybe they've experienced it in the past um, or they don't know what to do. And so we can help them in all of those areas. So enjoy what's uh, connecting with other people. What's special about them and what's fun about you? What is special about your child or teen? You know, let's help them understand that by nurturing their interests. Um, so that conversation and connection is a give and take. This is the thing that we really want to teach kids from early on. It's not you and it's not me. It's us. Resilience is the antidote to anxiety. It reduces um, shame. Um, it occurs when we take our skills from past situations and apply them to new, situa new, new ones, especially ones that challenge or frighten us. Kids need to face struggles. They will face struggles and they have to learn how to meet these struggles. They may, they may stumble and fall down. How are they gonna learn to get back up? We all have done this. We've all struggled. This is how we build competency. This is um, what it means to have a growth mindset, which is fundamentally linked to resilience. So, um, you know, we don't want kids to suffer needlessly, but sometimes a little disappointment can be a very worthwhile growth experience. And I think you know what I mean. Um, so we want to, uh, as I said, identify those islands of competency, you know, those character strengths and established or observed interests. We want to help our kids connect with charismatic adults. That's not, you know, George Clooney or Julia Roberts. It's actually or Taylor Swift or whoever, you know, um, Beyonce or Jay-Z or anybody. A charismatic adult is someone who has empathy for you, who cares about you, someone who believes in you. You may very well be this person, and there may be other people too. So we want to kind of nurture that village around your child or teen. Um, Jade, age 12, really describes a growth mindset when she says, hopefully this works. If not, I'm going to have to find a new way to do it, to be brave. It's hard sometimes, but there's always a way to pick yourself up. Now, I hope you'll stay connected with me. Um, if, um, you, if you didn't see it, there's this free handout, which summarizes what I've talked about today. And you can also try to uh, scan it on your computer with the QR code. So I'm going to leave this up here for a few seconds and, uh, while we you know, transition into questions and answers. Thank you for your wonderful um, uh, attention and for joining me. And I look forward to answering some of your questions. Um, can you say more about the connection between anxiety and growth mindset? So a growth mindset is the, is the idea that I'm going to try something and see what happens. And I believe that, um, you know, if, if I stumble, that I'm not a failure, but that that's a natural part of learning. I'm curious about the, the sort of the pa paradoxes and puzzles of whatever um, whatever I'm trying to do. And what happens with anxiety is it kind of pushes that mindset to the side and it instead really kind of um, ex it exaggerates a fixed mindset, which is my skills are, are limited, my intelligence is limited, my character traits are limited, and they will not change over time. So why bother? And so what happens is that with a fixed mindset in conjunction with anxiety is that kids sort of pull back and they're not willing to be able to say something like my worry monster says, blah, 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 and you can't handle it. Well, let me tell you, I can because I have a unique and creative mind. The next question is, how do others communication styles impact the likelihood of developing RSD? Um, when you live with people who are, who blame, who shame, uh, you know, who, who may yell and make you feel inadequate um, because they are directly putting you down. You know, generally um, people 
can't make you feel a way, you feel a way. But what happens is that in, in for kids with adults who are directly criticizing them, who are pointing out their flaws, who are doing this, kids feel um, inadequate. And that sense of inadequacy, you know, leads towards um, the development and actually contributes towards the development of anxiety because you don't feel like you're enough. It also contributes actually to perfectionism as well, which is a form of anxiety we didn't talk about today. Maybe I'll come back sometime and talk about that. But perfectionism is a co is a sort of in, in a um, is a two sided um, response or a coping um, strategy for um, anxiety. Because on the one hand, you know there can be a helpful perfectionism. You know, I want to do a good job. I want to get started. I'm motivated. But then there can be, you know, really um, toxic perfectionism, which is I never get it right. You know, I'm not. You know, I can't get started. I don't know where to start. I'm because I'm not going to get it right, or I'm working on it, but I can't turn it in because it's never quite finished and good enough. How does skin picking fit into anxiety? Um, skin picking is considered one of the um, conditions under the anxiety umbre umbrella. It's um, kids who ha ha who are who engage in skin picking. Um, it's it's a way of it's a it's a way of distracting themselves from the anxiety that they're feeling. It's kind of like when when you pick your nails or you bite your 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 cuticles, they're they're similar. Um, trichotillomania, which is the pulling out of hair, is also part of the anxiety disorder. They're all under that banner. How can I deal with the fear of success? Oh, I love this question. Thank you. Um, this is a great question. And it's a great question for kids who are what I call outside the box thinkers, because they may not have a lot of experiences with success. And when they have an experience with success, um, they're going to be surprised by it. And so then they're afraid, well, you know, if I did it once, am I going to be able to do it again? Me, I'm probably not going to be able to do it again. So I become afraid of, of whether or not I can repeat it. So that's one aspect uh, of, to your question, one answer. Um, the other part of that is um, fear of success. Actually, you know, if you start to succeed at things, it's going to change the conversation in your head about who you are. Because you can't say um, things like, I hear kids say to themselves, I'm a loser. I stink at this, that, or the other. No one likes me because, oh my goodness, that's not what's happening in my world. So now I have to change that to I'm someone who can actually succeed at things. I'm someone people like. And that's very scary because the negative, the negative conversation, that negative voice has been so powerful for so long. The next question um, refers to um, twice exceptional um, mm -hmm. and anxiety. Can you briefly talk about that? Um, well, this is a great question. Uh, also requires a longer answer. Um, so, you know, when kids are twice exceptional, and if you don't know what that is, um, twice exceptional kids are kids who have high IQs, in in some areas um, and perhaps um, uh, lower IQs or other kinds of struggle uh, in other areas. So for example, we might see a, uh, a teenager who um, has a psycho a psychological educational evaluation, what's called a psychoed evaluation. And on this uh, on their cognitive testing, their um, their verbal skills and their um, Visual skills could be, you know, at 108, 138, which is way in the superior range. But then their working memory could be at 110. So that's a very big difference. And so what's going to happen for these kids, they're super bright, but they're not going to be able to perform at the level with which they comprehend information. And so they experience this intense internal disconnect.
And that in and that can happen for kids who also, you know, can have ADHD and be on the spectrum. Um, it can happen for kids who have ADHD and a learning disability. But in general, their IQ is quite high or, you know, in the superior range, over 130 in some areas, and then in a different category for uh, for some of the other factors. Um, and what happens for these kids is that they get messages from educators and parents and coaches and teachers or, you know, whoever, um, that, you know, you're so smart, why can't you do this? You're just lazy. And, and the, or um, I don't understand what's wrong with you. You're wasting your potential and things like this, right? And, but they're not able to access their potential because they're struggling because they have these internal discrepancies um, or they struggle with, you know, um, bipolar disorder, even, or they may struggle with, um, you know, to depression or um, how this feeds anxiety is that when you get those messages, when you yourself experience this disconnect internally, that's so significant, um, you are, you become anxious, you're worried, you don't trust yourself to actually be able to produce or perform at the level that you want to. And so we see a lot of times with these kids is depression, um, is a kind of um, quitting in some areas and isolation. They also feel misunderstood by adults um, and other kids, and they themselves may not understand who they are. Um, what are your thoughts on offering or suggesting extracurricular activities to anxiety prone kids with ADHD? And do you have a general age when you think that might be best or best be avoided? Hmm, that's a great question. Um, Younger kids with ADHD, and I'm talking like kindergarten and first grade, some of them might like extracurricular activities, but some of them, and this might go up through second grade, may feel like they're so, you know, overwhelmed when they get home from school. Like there's been so much stimulation that they can't possibly go do something else. In general, I suggest having some kind of physical activity for those kids, whether it's swimming, or soccer, or um, gymnastics, something where they're moving their bodies um, to help them learn how that to to um, learn how to the skills of the sport, but also to help them, you know, function in a way that isn't using the same parts of their brain that are overwhelmed when they're at school. Now. One of the things that we want to really think about is that a lot of social relationships develop in after school activities. So, um, you know, if your child it can really only handle one after school activity, make sure that you take the time to think about what suits them and what would they actually be able to enjoy and cope with. Um, when kids are a little older, um, I think it is helpful once they, you know, you've started with one activity, if they're interested in something else, maybe in playing an instrument or, um, you know, taking an art class or theater improv, um, you know, you can, you can talk about that with them or if they have a friend to go with, that's really important, particularly in middle school. But I think having something to do that is bigger than who they are is important because they learn how to participate in a group. They learn how to be part of a community. They learn how to manage some of their, their nervousness or worries um, and, and take small steps to to build confidence. They also will will hopefully get um, the support of their peers and, and start to have commonalities, common interests with them that can translate from the activity into school or into a play date or something like that. Uh, do you have any final thoughts before we close out for the evening, Dr. Sam? Yeah, Yes, I want to thank Chad for all of its incredible work that um, it does to serve our community. And um, I want to say something to parents directly. You're doing the best you can with the tools you have available. And so is your child. And this is where self-compassion and compassion for others come together in love. And um, 
connecting, positively connecting with your kids will help them reduce their anxiety and will help you feel more confident about their abilities to function in the world. Please stay connected with me. Um, check out my social media at Dr. Sharon Celine. And, um, uh, I, you know, I have some YouTube videos that you might find helpful as well. There's a lot of resources on my website. They're free and they're for you to uh, use to help you in your journey. Thank you so much for joining me. And thank you so much, Trish and Chad, for inviting me. Thank you very much. Uh, have a good evening, everybody. I do have your questions here in the Q&A log. It's just we've gone over time. I will forward the unanswered questions to Dr. Selene so that she'll see them. So thank you very much. Have a good evening, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Bye.